All right. Should be up and going here. Hello to everybody out there. Trust that everybody's doing well. No. You had a few minutes here just to let people come in and everything, get everything all situated and everything else. So, we're going to have a lot to cover today. Um, so, okay. We will uh, get started here. We're going to be talking today, as the title of this description thing says, about the six biggest electric needs, in quotations. And they are refrigeration, lighting, water, pump, and plumbing, make, moving your water along, in other words, um, your heat, cooking, and communication, or telephone, whatever else. And um, the interesting thing is, you know, these are all considerations that you have to think about when you go off grid. But the interesting thing is, all six of those things, our ancestors did not have them. And people for thousands of years lived without them. Hmm. Something to think about there. So if man lived without those six things for thousands of years, well, there's a pretty good chance we can too, if uh, we so choose. Um, and even if you're on grid, you know, there's some things that you can you know, get out of your life, or at least if the power grid goes down and whatever else, you can certainly find alternatives to that. So first and foremost, let's talk about refrigeration, right? Now, um, I don't have a uh, picture of a propane refrigerator, but you can get uh, basically the two types of refrigerators that you can get that would be a somewhat more efficient for off-grid use would be um, a propane one. You'll have those in a lot of the travel trailers, the campers and whatever else. They run off of propane. Um, a lot of guys will take them out of a out of an RV or travel trailer, whatever, and they'll use them in their off-grid situation. You can also buy actual propane powered um, refrigerators. I actually, um, years ago, we were going to buy a place that had a propane refrigerator and a propane uh, big chest freezer. Actually, it's a pretty rare one. The realtor was telling me I'd never had even seen one in all my, you know, looking into off grid living and off grid living types of things that I did. So it was pretty interesting. The place was almost completely run by propane. This one, you know, house we were actually going to buy at one point in time. And um, so, uh, um, yeah, it's a cool topic. Yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> Refrigeration is a cool topic. Just looked there and saw your comment. Um, but uh, propane is an option. Okay, they are expensive. They can be rather expensive. The other option is to get a electric refrigerator or chest freezer and try to run it off of solar or wind power or whatever else you have at your off-grid property. Um, that's another one that you can do. Or you can get a small 12 volt refrigerator and um, run that off of solar. They're a lot more efficient. Okay. This is the type actually that we have right here. This is an angle refrigerator slash freezer. It has a little, little dial right here. You can see I'm pointing to it with my mouse there. And you can turn it, you can adjust the temperature so it's either refrigerating or you can go the whole way down and it uh, will freeze as well. And it can be run off of 110 volt or 12 volt. So you could actually take that and put it in the back of your vehicle if you have a vehicle that's, you know, big enough trunk area. And you could take it and you can actually have the 12 volt, volt cord going up to your cigarette lighter, 12 volt adapter, whatever you want to call it. I was raised calling them cigarette lighters. So that's what most people use them for in vehicles. But uh, thankfully, we never did. My parents never smoked or anything. So, but, um, you can put it into the 12 volt adapter and then you can actually, if you were driving back and forth to work, you could actually have your angle in your vehicle. If you live off grid till you get things set up and actually as you're driving to work, it could be back there running off of the vehicle's electric system and cooling down your food or even freezing your food or whatever else. And then you can take it with you. They're portable. You can pick them up and carry them. They're not exactly lightweight, but they're not going to, you know, break your back or anything either so uh, 
pretty efficient. There you can see that it actually has, well, you can't really see too good. Up here is for the power cord, that little gray area right there. And then this one has just one um, compartment. It has a little wire basket that you can pull in and out. So like, let's say that you took it with you in your vehicle and it's back in there and you get to some place to your workplace or whatever else. And you can, and there'd be a refrigerator there that you could put your stuff in. You take the wire basket up out, carry it in with you. And then when you go to leave, you put it in the refrigerator at your job. And then when you go to leave, bring it out, stick it in your angle and drive home. Um, they're very handy. They're, they're a neat uh, option. The other thing about off-grid um, refrigeration that you're going to see with all of these different angle models, some of them do have two compartments like that one there. Like you can see the two different compartments. Um, but the, the thing with off-grid refrigeration that you have to think about is you want it to be a top loading. You don't want the, the regular refrigerator with the door that opens towards you because you lose a lot of that cold air. When, when you open the door, the cold air comes down onto the floor. And, and if you have bare feet in the summer months, you'll feel that cold air from the refrigerator you know, coming down onto your feet. So you want a something that opens like the chest freezers do, top opening. If you're off grid, it will save more energy that way. Another thing that you can do actually which I was planning on doing, but plans changed and whatever else. You can get a fairly inexpensive um, conversion, little electric conversion thing where you can take a chest freezer and convert it to a refrigerator. And so you just change the wiring a little bit. And you, I forget what all you have to do, but there's videos on YouTube, people changing chest freezers into refrigerators for off-grid use because a chest freezer has a lot more insulation in it than a refrigerator. And they're, they're, better because of the top loading feature to use off grid. So that's one option, kind of the high tech option. Um, there's another one. We have an angle and then we also have a winter W H Y N T E R uh, refrigerator. And we have, so we have two different options for refrigeration and on our property, the winter actually has two different controls. So it has two different uh, compartments. You can do one freezing, one refrigeration, or both freezing, both refrigeration, whatever you want. Um, so that's an option there. Um, the next option for refrigeration off grid, which would not be as high tech, actually a lot more low tech, would be a cold cellar, roof house, ice house, whatever you want to call it. Um, an ice house is not the same as a root cellar, I should say that. An ice house is where you actually go out and you cut the big blocks of ice and then you could put those in. Um, I didn't actually show any pictures of this, but you can have a like an ice chest, the old ice chest that had. I mean, let me just do a quick thing for that here. Um, uh, I don't think it might not come up with that. Um, OK, a wood one. There we go. Um, an old ice chest like these, these old antique um, ice chests. And you know, are they going to show any ones inside? But they had some pretty big ones, and you could put ice in the top of them. A lot of people had these before they had electric ref refrigeration. And you would basically put ice in the top of the thing, and then it, the cold comes down throughout, and then the ice, as it melts, it goes down a little tube and out into a tray. and drains out or whatever else but that's another option that you can use you cut the blocks of ice in the winter and then you store them in a building with sawdust on top of it and they'll preserve almost through the summer months again you can look this stuff up if you're interested in it um, so that's another option um, if you have a seller at your off-grid location and um, I mean I literally had uh, my younger sister and her husband had a house in town. It was built in the 1800s. And you go down into the basement. It was these massive big stone walls down there. And you go down into the basement and there was actually a the main area of the basement. And then there were steps going down into an even lower room. Well, that was actually the root cellar um, where they would store root vegetables like potatoes and whatever else. Um, you get down low enough and it's not going to be freezing unless you live in Alaska or Siberia or something like that, a really far northern environment. Then you get into the permafrost thing and whatever. Um, but you can store a lot of things down in a cellar and it won't freeze. 
um, we actually store apples in our cellar and they will last from October the whole way through till about April and they're fine. They don't rot or anything else. I mean, you'll get a few that had spots on them and then they, they'll rot a little bit, but the vast majority of them, they stay pretty good. Um, so there's that. Uh, another thing that you can do if you're in a northern environment is you can actually build a cache, a food cache like this. You'll see these a lot in Alaska. Um, you have to build them up high enough uh, like that. And this one doesn't have it, but a lot of times they'll wrap metal around the posts going up, the supports going up to keep the bear from going up in and helping themselves. Of course, it's not usually a problem in the winter, but, you know, <laughs> because the bears are hibernating, but you might get some, you know, wolverine or something like that that would go up in or uh, a, uh, I don't know if they have fishers in Alaska. We have them here. But, um, you know, another little option that you can use. I mean, we can, for the most part, we can usually store things um, here in northern Maine. We can store meat or other frozen types of things um, for a long time. If you have a in, sort of an uninsulated shed that's not heated, you can put things in a cooler and put it in there and it'll stay frozen pretty much the whole winter long. If you have a day where it actually warms up a little bit into the 40s or 50s for some weird reason the meat if there's enough of it in there it will stay insulated enough inside that it will not fall out um so another thing that you can do so that's keeping kind of preserving food and its state that it's in and it's just frozen or refrigerated okay but what about other types of food preservation um well another type that's another traditional type if you don't have a cold cellar or whatever is to actually ferment your food. Many people know about that, but it's another thing that's very good. Here's a bunch of pictures of uh, fermentation crocs. Um, and you can take, of course, the famous one would be sauerkraut. You can take cabbage and you can slice it thin, and then you put it down in there with some salt and another layer of, of cabbage with some salt and or, you know, shredded cabbage. And you can do that, and then you put these stones here on top of the... Um, shredded cabbage with the salt and then that weighs down on it and then it'll start to ferment and everything and and that'll last you you know a good month you know two months maybe three months if you really get out there with it but fermentation it's a whole science of its own you can ferment almost anything um, really fascinating and it actually adds probiotics to the food the food gets much more healthy um, really will put you into good health I remember my older sister, the one time she was feeling really sick and um, there was a old guy that she, they know him really well. They live on his farm down in West Virginia and she was just really sick. And he said, he said, you know what you need? And she said, what? And, and uh, he said, uh, you need some sauerkraut juice. And she thought he was kidding. He has kind of a weird sense of humor. And he said, and she said, yeah, right, you know, that's the last thing I want right now. I don't even want to think about eating you know, or drinking some sauerkraut juice. And he said, I'm serious. Go get some sauerkraut juice. And he got some for her and he made her drink it. And she said it was, oh, okay, this, you know, I love sauerkraut, but right now I'm really feeling sick. She said within about a half hour, she was back to normal, just totally fine. So, and I've experienced that myself. Uh, fermentation is really good. You can get into the kombucha, you can get into... Uh, kefir. I mean, you can get into a lot of things on fermentation. It's fascinating, and that's what ancient people did. They weren't trying to figure out how to run a, a electric refrigerator off of solar power or something like that. Um, there are some good things too, refrigeration, modern refrigeration, but fermentation is a much better thing, in my opinion. Another thing that you can do is smoke meat. Um, Put it into a smokehouse. There's different types of smoking of meat. There's hot smoking, cold smoking. Again, you can put meat in a brine solution, which is not brine, but brine, um, which is sort of water and salt and things. I mean, there's again another whole situation. Um, you can see some of the different things here. You hang the meat up there and then you smoke it and you put um, salt on it and everything else too. Salt and smoke will preserve meat. Um, you know, 20, 30 years, I mean, you can preserve a piece of meat. It'll last for a very long time. 
And it's kind of funny because uh, the same farmer that I was talking about before, um, he had a smokehouse there at their farm, at the family farm down in West Virginia. And some city people, I guess, came the one time or something, and they came in. And they said, hey, they said, your chicken house is on fire. Said, what? Yeah, your chicken house out there. There's smoke coming out of it. <laughs> it's not a chicken house. I'd say, you know, meat smoking house. So, um, yeah, that's another way that you can preserve meat. And then once it's smoked and salted correctly, you can just hang it in a cool place and whatever else, and it will last for a very long time, extremely long time. Uh, another way to preserve food without refrigeration, alternatives to refrigeration, in other words, would, of course, be dehydrating. Um, you can dehydrate with a little bit of heat and air, and you can dry you know, fruit, vegetables, um, a lot of different things. Of course, meat, people would know about meat, meat, beef jerky, excuse me, or different jerkies from different types of meat. Um, that's another way to do it. And um, we do have an electric dehydrator. We have um, used it for a lot of different things. We'll dry, you know, herbs and grind them up, you know, into powders. Um, we have dried all kinds of different things. Uh, we actually went and um, down to the ocean and we got some bladder rack, which is a form of kelp and um, really high, you know, nutrient dense type of thing. Brought it back and... Um, laid them out on the drying racks and, and we dried it and then you grind it up in a, like a blender and you have like a seasoning that you can sprinkle on your food and uh, kind of a salty, you know, kelp type flavor, really good for you. Um, we actually need to go do that this year, hopefully when uh, summertime comes, but um, there are ways to do, you, you say, well, then if I'm doing dehydration though, that would be electric. So it's not really off grid. Well, that's true. You could run it off of solar, or you could actually make a solar dehydrator. Um, we have dehydrated things in our school bus, one of our school buses. Um, when we had our kitchen inside one of our old school buses, we had the wood stove heat, plus we also had the sun, passive solar heat coming through the single pane windows on the school buses. And then we just laid out things on old window screens, so you get the air movement the whole way around it. And we dried out a lot of different things just completely with no electricity. Right out here, I've done a few studies out in our sun porch at the ministry office here. It's again, single pane windows. If you get double or triple pane windows, this will not work. But old single pane windows, just one layer of glass um, on a nice hot sunny day, it will get really hot out there. And you know we've seen it go up to 120, 130 degrees in that room out there, that sun porch in the summer months. Even in the fall, it'll still get up to 70 to 90 degrees. In the winter, if it's a really good sunny day, it can still hit 70 degrees out there with no other types of heat. So put things on window screens or make your own screen material. Put them out in a nice sunny room like that. If it's single pane windows, temperature goes up and it will dry them. It will, again, we've dried a lot of different things. One of the things that we've been drying recently is uh, choke cherries, actually. Um, you can use choke cherries. They grow up here in the wild. They're another kind of a northern superfood. And you can actually grind them up into flour and use them, combine them with wheat flour or whatever else, which we, you know, have experimented with and it works pretty well. It's a sort of a Native, Native American thing that they do. Um, you can also, um, you know, heat up the choke cherries. They have a really high, um, like a tallowy type of thing where it's really kind of waxy, kind of. Uh, they don't taste all that good. They taste like cherry, but they have a really weird, you know, kind of weird thing to them when you just eat them raw. But if you cook them a little bit lightly, not to a full boil, but just cook them a little bit and then run them through a strainer, you can get a really nice, like a cherry drink out of them. And again, very healthy. And then you keep the pulp and the seeds and you dry them and turn them into flour. So pretty neat and people don't even waste their time on them up here. I've not seen very many people picking them and they just grow right along the roads and people drive right by them and go, well, what's that, you know? And they're actually really good for you. Um, so dehydration, another alternative to refrigeration. Again, different ways to think about it. Um, and uh, another way to think about this whole thing, and I will be talking about this in one of the future seminars, but the thing of re rethinking refrigeration. Okay, in other words, eating things in season, 
and not having to store them. And, you know, I have to, how do I store, you know, the red raspberries that grow in July so I can eat them in January or something? Well, um, you know, people would say, well, you can can it, you can put it into jelly. Eh, yeah, you're using a lot of sugar and you're heating them up and you're pretty much destroying any nutritional value to the raspberry at that point in time. Might taste good with the jelly, but questionable. Um, but again, rethinking refrigeration. Are there ways that I can ferment this to make it more healthy and not have to use sugar as a preservative? Um, how about, you know, not, you know, in the past, they wouldn't have killed a, a big animal, a large animal in the summer months because it'd be very hard to preserve it. You wait till the fall, which is why you have a lot of the hunting season in the fall. Other reasons, too, I understand. But um, you hunt in the fall, kill the animal, and then you can smoke some of the meat and eat some of the meat and whatever and you preserve through the winter especially the more north you go um you can of course freeze in the winter or you know freeze without electricity is what i'm saying okay next item so that's refrigeration and then at the end of this uh, video we can talk about if anybody says hey you missed this or whatever else for ref refrigeration food preservation then i'd be open to that but um number two Another big electric need is the thing of lighting. What do you do? And I mean, these first two are basically the ones we've struggled with. The other ones coming up, the other uh, four things here, we don't even struggle with those. Uh, I'll explain why here in a little bit. Um, lighting, how do you keep your place lit? Well, there's a number of options there. Um, first and foremost, I won't talk about this just yet, the picture I put up here. But first and foremost, you can use, you know, the, the regular incandescent light bulb, 110 volt. There are people that can have enough solar to run those things off grid. Um, 110 volt, the incandescent light bulbs, the old style with the filament in it, um, they put off almost no electrical frequency at all. They're, they're very healthy. You get the compact fluorescent light bulbs that have the kind of curly cute. Those things are really toxic, especially if you break one. Bad idea. The LED, the modern LED lights are better. They don't, they do put off some electrical field, but they're not, you know, super toxic like the CFL compacts, CFL ones are. Um, but to run that stuff off grid, you really need a big solar system, a very big solar system and a big battery bank and the whole thing. Um, so they're not really the best idea. You say, what about gas lights? You know, you have the, the Coleman type light here the dual fuel type here and whatever else these gas lanterns you know with the little wicks inside there um i have used them i've been in places where they've been used but you can't use them inside without any ven ventilation i mean if you have a place that's open on the sides like a gazebo or something well okay you can use them but you really don't want to use those inside um because they just put off a lot of toxic fumes so Gas lanterns, not really all that great of an idea um, for using inside. I mean, you can have them on your property, off-grid property. Certainly, they, they do work for outside if you're working on something or whatever else. But um, can't really use them inside. What about an oil lamp? Uh, one of the best types is the Aladdin brand, um, like these right here. Uh, these are really good ones, and they have the... The little like the mantle or whatever inside there that the little wick thing that you light that and then they put off a pretty good amount of light you can get the lampshade for them very beautiful absolutely very nice um but you're dealing again with putting smoke into the atmosphere inside your tiny home um or your home your cabin whatever you have off grid um and there's a fire hazard there now they're not as it's not like gasoline or something where if you knock it over, it's not like a Molotov cocktail that blows up and boom. And no, but it would burn. It could definitely burn if you knock the oil lamp over. And um, so um, they are good. They do light well, but there's some that actually mount to walls like this one right here. You can kind of see mounts to a wall. Um, another option a lot of people would think about it be candles. And again, you're dealing with a lot of um, petroleum-based uh, waxes and things like that. Not really the best to 
um, have in your place and things unless you have adequate ventilation. Um, you say, well, what about beeswax candles? Well, that would be a lot better, you know, um, more appropriate and things. Um, the one, you know, our, we have a little cabin that we built on our land and um, back in the woods, the, we get these little noceums and they can get right through your window screens and they'll just, you know, be biting it all night long. It's quite miserable. <laughs> So I, I had this brilliant idea. I thought, well, I'll just leave a candle burning by one of the windows. And that way, any of the no seams come in, they'll go for the light and they'll get burned up. And it was working quite well. But we had the candle going all night long. And we got up in the morning and our noses, where we were breathing in, was black there. A little bit of black on each of our noses. And it was because of the candle I guess the, the smoke was not going out enough and it was just in there and we're breathing this st stuff in all the time. So gas lanterns, oil lamps, and candles all um, put off fumes, put off smoke into the atmosphere. Not really that good of an option there. Um, they're all open flames, so there's a danger there. And they all also produce heat, which isn't really that much fun in the summertime when you're trying to stay cool. <laughs> Um, and also there's fuel dependence with the oil lamp and the uh, gas lantern. And as, when I say gas, it's not, you know, uh, 89 octane or 93 octane or something like that. It's a different type of uh, gas. Um, so what do we use? We don't use any kind of an open flame like that. What do we use? We don't have the big solar system to run incandescent light bulbs. This is what we use. Um, we use these Milwaukee... 18 volt rechargeable uh, lights is what we use. Um, we have this type here, these tall type, and they have three different light settings. You can push a little button and then they have different light settings. Um, we also have one of these in our closet, which lights up a lot better, but it's a little bit too bright for out in the living area. And they're very, these uh, batteries that you can get that hook up to this. They run tools of all different types, which I use those, you know, cordless tools when I'm building and things on our property. And they actually are pretty easy to recharge with a solar system. You can, I mean, in December, right around Christmas time, you have it, you know, the sunlight's really not real bright at that time of the year. You get into the winter solstice time there and things. Um, and it's very hard to charge the batteries at that point in time um, because you don't have much sunlight. And if you have you know, snowy um, weather and things for a week or two, well, then it gets kind of tricky. Um, if, I mean, if we were just relying completely on an off-grid property, that might get a little bit tough. But um, they work very well. I'll just show you an example here. Um, that's inside of our tiny house. One study I did on the Doctrine of Eminence, and that reflection on the wall there, that's one of our Milwaukee um, lights. And every... Every time you see this tongue and groove pine backdrop and this whiteboard here, those were all done in our tiny house. And some of those were done at night. And the lighting, the only lighting that was there was these uh, lanterns right here. That's it. And it also has a little USB charger, by the way, on the back there. So they work pretty well. Um, DeWalt also has a number of... of uh, you know, LED lantern type of things. I knew an Amish family that actually used the Walt lanterns in their house and it was very well lit. I mean, you would just go in there and think it's just regular lighting. Um, it's not real dark or anything else, but um, we have one of these type right here. Oliver uses in his room. And um, again, it's really makes for good lighting. So um, that's what we do for lighting. There's probably other options and, and whatever else, but that covers, I think, the main, you know, um, way to have lighting off grid. So um, now we're going, going to go into water pump slash plumbing, right? Because a lot of people, of course, if you have a on grid place and you have a drilled well, you have electricity running that well system. And there's a lot of components in there that have to work in order for your well to work. Even if you have, you know, um, like town, the water for, from the town, it still requires electricity to make the whole system work. So what do you do off grid? Well, there's a lot of different types of water pumps. 
There's a shallow well pitcher pump right there. Um, many people would be familiar with that. Um, of course, the old antique pitcher pump like this thing. A lot of people think about that where you make the handle go. You have to prime it and everything else, but then the water comes out. Um, they work pretty good. Um, the one I showed the other day about the, uh, the um, bison deep well pump. You know, but I mean, you can, again, you can do the research on this. It's not going to be real definitive here or whatever, but there's different ways that you can get, you know, water up out of a well or out of some other, like a cistern or whatever else. And um, so you can do it that way. Um, uh, this is the type of thing that we use because we go and we get water out of spring and then we bring it and then it has a little, you know, spigot. Uh, now it's going to take me there. Okay, well, you can see the little spigot there. You can turn it on and off and things. Um, it's sort of a gravity fed, somewhat of a very simple gravity fed because it's just, you know, the water inside the jug pushes it out and you can get, you get pretty good water pressure from it. You can easily wash your hands. It uh, works very well. And then you can store that water and, and things. And if you, Again, if you're on grid and you have a power outage, you say, well, what are we going to do for washing our hands? Well, if you have one of these jugs around with some water in it, pick it up, get it up on top of your, by your sink or whatever, and turn it on, and there's your running water. Works very well. That's originally why I bought them uh, many years before I even met my wife. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, like an uphill spring or a cistern that's mounted up on um, stilts and things. Um, you can do that and then run plumbing down into the house. That presents some challenges, though, if you live in a northern environment with pipes freezing and things, you'd have to drain it before winter. And then you kind of, not real great there, but uh, solar-powered electric pumps would be another thing. I actually knew a guy that had an off-grid property in the area here, and um, he was putting in a solar-powered uh, water pump. So that's possible. Um, you could also get a little 12-volt, uh, like a bilge pump that you would use on a boat or whatever else you can do that. I've seen people do that. Um, another thing here is the RAM pump. This was mentioned yesterday. And um, just type in RAM pump. And again, this thing here, it basically, I think it fills with air somehow. And it kind of, it goes up and down like that. And it pumps water uphill. Pretty neat setup. I've never had one like that before, never messed with it or anything else, but they do work. Um, what I was very familiar with growing up was actually windmills on Amish farms. And um, these old windmills like this, uh, this type here, this is the type of windmill a lot of people think of, the, the newer wind farms. And that's not what I'm talking about. This old style like this, um, this windmill would turn. And, you know, we diff different times we visited Amish neighbors and things and we go in there to their house and they turn on the water and the water would go. It would just kind of out in spurts. Well, why? Well, because the windmill is turning and it's making a little piston go up and down like that, which is pumping water into the house. So that's how windmills work. Um, and if it's not a very windy day, what's well, kind of a problem? Kind of have the water. You know, pressure go down then so another thing to a way to get away from electricity is to there's different ways that you can pump your water um and you don't need electricity to do, to do it uh, next we'll have heat um, we'll talk about heat now because a lot of people you know if you're on grid you have an electric you can have electric heat like heat pumps are the big rage right now you know you have to get these heat pumps they're really good for the environment and everything else um you know they don't use fossil fuels unless you go back to the um power station the electric you know power station and then they're burning coal to produce your clean energy it's kind of a problem but um if you have any kind of oil heat be it hot water it heats up the hot water it's a forced hot air type of a thing it still requires electricity and if the power goes out you don't have any heat so most of the residential heat systems when you're on grid require electricity but what do you do if you don't have electricity or if you're off grid especially well wood stove and 
my favorite type of wood stoves, what I grew up with and what we currently use um, is an old Fisher wood stove. I think they're probably the best ones ever built in my opinion. This basic style where you have the stepped top like that, it goes up and up like this. And then on the door, you have the little, the little dial things that you turn and you turn them out and it makes more air go in. Fire burns hotter, you turn them in and it's less air going in, the fire burns lower. And people talk about, oh, they're not EPA, this and that, whatever else. Um, but yet the interesting thing is uh, the heat that these things produce. I've, I've been around modern stoves, literally had a, my parents bought a stove. Uh, I don't remember what brand it was, but it was one of these modern ones that's so many percent efficient and all this other stuff. And I literally had it, we had it burning as hot as we could get it. And I was sitting on top of the stove had the people that we bought it from, they came over and we said, the thing doesn't even work. It's not, I don't know what's going on here. We've been burning, you know, heating with wood for, you know, since the 1970s. This would have been in probably about 2002 or so when we did this. My parents bought a new place and I was, I helped them to get their stove set up and everything. And I was, you know, did all their firewood for them. And it was nice dry firewood. I've known about that for a long time. If you've seen my video on the firewood thing. And, I was literally, we had the, the wood stove heated completely and, you know, their brochure was showing that they're cooking on top of it and everything else, you know, frying eggs. And I said, there's no way that that could happen. I said, let me show you. And I, I sat on top of the stove, you know, kind of with my legs off the side and said, you know, this wouldn't happen on an old wood stove. <laughs> Not happening. I mean, we were ignorant. We thought we had a Fisher wood stove and it's, it's a wood stove, you know, all wood stoves heat the same. And then we went and we got this brand new one to put into the house that my parents bought. And the thing was just junk. I mean, it was completely lined with fire brick in the inside. It had all these chambers for the smoke to go in around and up this way and whatever else. And it just didn't produce any heat at all. And it had extra shields on the outside so you wouldn't get burned. And it was crazy. I mean, we could not even get the temperature up. And that's southeastern Pennsylvania, you know. So you go to Tractor Supply and you get some of these made in China wood stoves and things. They just don't heat very well. And that's why old vintage stoves like this one, the Fisher brand, there's a lot of different models. You're, you would have to find one used. Um, they're kind of antique stoves now. This is another one which I've never experienced, but I've heard a lot of really good stories. The all-nighter stoves, these big old stoves from the past, and those things, you know, you can put, I think, a 24-inch log in those things, and they burn, you know, truly all-nighter. But again, you see the same concept, the step top, they're stamped steel. They're made out of steel. They're not cast iron. That's another thing. Cast iron stoves. I've never had good experience with them um, in terms of really being good heating stoves. And again, the little the little dials, the little knobs on the door. And there's a lot of different varieties of stoves that are very similar. They have the door that swings open. You turn the handle, swing the door open. You turn your dials in or turn your dials out. And they work great. They've been heating people's homes beautifully for a long time. And again, you know, another thing I need to say about the old Fisher stove, um, you know, oh, it's, it's not efficient. It leaves, you know, coals in the thing and whatever. I've heard that one too. People have said that. And, you know, the funny thing is when you get a Fisher stove going, there's, it's rare you ever have to restart it because you'll have coals left over in the morning and you can go in even after the wood's burned out, you can go in put your wood on top and if you have some an old old bellows or whatever else you can blow it and re reignite the coals and things and I mean, it's just incredible i rarely ever use any kind of starter like a kindling or anything like that i mean for away for quite a long time i have to restart the stove but um for the most part when you're burning dry wood you can start them so easily so Another sort of a modern brand that would be a decent one would be um, Yodel stoves, like these down in here. There's a lot of uh, people try to copy them and whatever else because Yodel's been around for a long time. But Yodel stoves are pretty good um, from what I've heard. Never owned one, but I've known plenty of people that have had them, and they, they say they're pretty good. Um, you can get them old. You know, they, they go way back. I think they're the second oldest stove manufacturer in the world. And they're actually made, I think, in Norway and in Maine. I think they have a factory here in Maine as well, which is interesting. Um, 
another option for heat is a wood cook stove. Okay. Um, again, we have two, di two different wood cook stoves, uh, one that we used on our school bus and then another one for another building. And then both are not even being used right now, but we're, you know, we're going to keep them. Both of them are older uh, stoves from the early 1900s and they work really well. Now they don't heat quite as good as a actual, you know, wood stove does, but then you have a really huge cooking surface on them and you have a little like this one here, you can see it's very fancy, but this one here, this is your oven right here. This is where you put the wood in this little door right there. That's your ash. Uh, well, that actually, I'm not sure that might even be because this is the ash clean out down here. This might be sort of a little shaker area or whatever. But you can load a lot of them. You can load the wood in here. You can load the wood in there, or you can take the top burners off and put the wood down in from the top. And then mostly they'll have like a little lever or something that you can flip, and it'll, you know, normally the heat from the fire here just goes right up straight up out the pipe, which goes in here. But then if you flip the little lever, then it it goes down around the firebox and then up and out. And that way it heats up the oven right here. This is a water like a water jacket on the side there. If you can put water in it, then you have hot water whenever you need it. This is sort of the little warming area up here. You lift that up and then you can put your, you know, butter in there that needs to thaw out or whatever that you want to thaw out. You can put it up in that warming oven area there. Um, just amazing. They work very well. And we cooked for a whole year on a wood cook stove and I'd still be doing it if it wasn't for the fact that the uh, school bus did not block the mosquitoes from getting into it. And it was miserable being in there so um but wood cook stoves are another way which we'll be getting back to that here in a little bit um another thing that you can do oh and another thing that you could do of course would be to have a coal fired stove but then you're you can't really produce your own coal so you're dependent on somebody bringing the coal to you deliveries uh, with that coal burns a little bit hotter than wood but then it's really dirty as well it makes a lot of black you know, soot and everything. I used to work at the Strasburg Railroad down in Pennsylvania, so I know about coal dust. Um, it gets on everything. It's pretty bad. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, there's kind of the modern wood cook stove. We'll get back to that here in a little bit. But um, rocket thermal mass heaters, that's another one that you can do. Um, pretty fascinating. You need a pretty heavy duty floor to hold the thing. It weighs a lot, but it's essentially a like a see if i can get a close-up uh it's not really a good picture of it um okay it's kind of you can see it there this little hole right here is where you put the wood in and then it, the it basically pulls the heat down through up a tube here and then down inside this trash older or not trash can but the old oil barrel and then up and out and what they'll do actually not up and out this one what they do here is then it goes in through here around and then twists and comes back down and then like that and you can do you know 12 feet or more of you know basically horizontal with a slight upgrade to it and it, you can send the the heat through there and it'll heat up this whole thermal mass right here and it will hold that heat then for a long time um really fascinating i've seen people do that and you know pretty neat thing that you can do and you can use very little wood and, and whatever else too which is you know really interesting um so that's another thing that you can do um i know in russia i forget what they call them if we have any people from russia watching you can put it in the comments but uh pila or something i forget what they call it not a pila I forget what the russian thermal mass stoves are called but i know over in estonia i've seen them as well looking at houses there and there's other places around there that do this and they build these huge big thermal masses and you can put a wood you know your fire in here and rake the coals down into this way and then you have a sort of bread oven like this woman's you know demonstrating right there you can see that and then you can move the coals down in here and put them over this way and <laughs> and do all this stuff and then there's a lot of times I even have like a little bed up on part of it where the thermal mass heats up and it'll take you a good day or two just to get the thing up to temperature where it's staying warm but then it works it'll just hold that heat for a long time uh, again really fascinating very old 
uh, ancient type of a thing. Um, another thing that you could do in an off-grid situation would be to have a propane heater. Um, but then you're dependent on the fuel and there's, you know, if it's vented, then that's not too bad. But if it's kind of a, a ventless type, then you might be getting some fumes in. And, uh, and the problem with propane for heat is it actually causes a lot of moisture. And so you get condensation problems. A lot of people with um, travel trailers, motorhomes, things like that, they actually will heat with propane. And then they're always wiping the condensation off the walls and off the ceiling and everything else. Um, so while you could do that, I would not recommend it. I think it's a bad idea. Another familiar type of off-grid heat, heating without any electricity, say it that way, it would be an old kerosene heater or a kerosene heater. I'm saying the newer ones, um, they run off of K1 kerosene, which is, I guess, more of a refined than just your standard kerosene or something. We got one when we first moved to Maine. Is actually, I think this one right here, that exact model, because it was black like that. I'm pretty sure that was it. And you have to basically, when you shut this off, this wick is supposed to go out. Well, um, the one night we shut ours off, and I thought I had the whole thing done correctly, and it looked like it was out. And it was just still tiny, little tiny bit of it was lit yet, and it was started to release some smoke. And it was... You know, I, I didn't do something right, and it was releasing some smoke, and some fumes were coming out. And I woke up in the middle of the night. It was about two or three in the morning. I woke up and I thought, "Why do I smell fuel so like really strong kerosene smell?" And I thought, "Oh boy!" And I quick and I ran. I opened up the window, and I said, "We have to get out of here." So we went and we took everything. You know, we took the heater and took it outside, set it outside, and we got outside and we. We're out walking around, you know, at three o'clock in the morning or whatever it was, just trying to get some fresh air. And thankfully, it didn't harm us. But, you know, it could have been a really bad thing, you know, that we could have died on those fumes. Never had a problem like that with the wood stove. So um, I'm not a real big fan of kerosene heaters. Uh, it's just something, in, you know, and the, the K1... Uh, kerosene stuff is really expensive and we we're trying to get cheaper kerosene and it wouldn't I think that was part of the reason it wasn't burning quite right or something and so <laughs> I'm not a big fan of kerosene heaters um you know and again both kerosene heat and propane heat you're fuel dependent so if you're off grid you know well the cost of fuel went up what do I do now well with firewood you it really doesn't matter what the price of fuel is. I mean, the the a little bit that you have to buy for your chainsaw to do firewood is really not that much. And you can split wood by hand with a splitting mole, um, which to me is a lot more efficient than a actual hydraulic splitter. Um, I think they're actually slower than splitting by hand if you get experienced with, you know, a good splitting mole. So, which I've done for many years. Um, number five, we're going to go on to next here, and that would be cooking. Um, again, propane cook stove. A lot of people have those. You can get the smaller type, you know, for off grid, like this one here. Let's take me to the actual. Uh, you can kind of see it there. You know, there's the small little propane um, cook stove. You can get the little countertop type as well, and, and whatever. Um, and there are some. Uh, of these old wood cook stoves that are actually a dual fuel and this is sort of a newer model here but you can get ones that are old um, that actually had propane and wood cook stove all together in one stove I've seen those um, actually seen them in use too so not just seen pictures I've seen them in people's places being used so that's another option and of course the I think the the uh, Where's the thing at there? Yeah, the old wood cook stoves. Um, they're really good ones. Mostly they're going to be uh, cast iron. And some of them, like you know, this one right here, can be very ornate, very beautiful. Um, there's another one. Really nice old wood cook stove. And some really neat different types. Um, a lot of them made in Maine, actually. If you go back far enough. Uh, they they do a good job of cooking food year-round. 
but they're not the best with heating if they're cast iron. The more modern ones like this, um, a lot of these are made out of steel and they actually work a lot better at heating your home. Um, there's some that are actually made out of, uh, they'll have soapstone inserts and things like that, which hold the heat better. And though, again, they heat really well, um, but there's more modern wood cook stoves that really do a good job of, you know, heating and making food. So, um, and of course, one thing that you can do too with the uh, uh, propane cook stove idea is you can also have a propane grill, just your outdoor regular barbecue type grill, and you can put it out on your deck or whatever else. Uh, we cooked with a propane grill like that for a long time. I'm um, just running it outside. Don't do it inside. Um, another option is, of course, cooking outdoors. Or if you have some kind of a Viking longhouse that you can have a fire right in the middle of the place and that's because it's a stone dirt floor and the smoke can go up out of a area, then, you know, great. Uh, but mostly you're going to be cooking outside if you have cast iron and open, you know, fire and you can cook that way. Um, a big thing here in northern Maine is they call bean hole beans. And what they do is they dig a hole in the dirt and then you take a lot of coals and things, hot coals, and you put them down in and you take a Dutch oven which a Dutch oven is a cast iron, sort of a cast iron pan that has a lid on it, like that. And you put the your baked beans in that cast iron you know, pot, put the lid on top, put it down into the hole with all the hot coals. You put some more hot coals on top and you bury it. And then you come back the next day and, and the beans are ready to go. And um, so pretty neat thing that you can do there. But again cooking over an open fire yeah it has its benefits but what if it's raining what if the bugs are really bad you know there's a lot of things that enter into that do you really want to do that all the time you first get started sure absolutely they work really good while you're building your place your homestead or whatever else um if you have a power outage certainly and you have a backyard or something where you can have a little open fire there and you can go out and you can cook on that another good option um, and that, that's, again, what, you know, just being uh, self-sufficient is all about, having a lot of options. Uh, think about, you know, this is another type of a thing. We actually have one of these, these um, Hunter stoves. It's an old gas can, and they, they rebuild them, and they make them into like a rocket stove. And down in here, you can see that the air goes in here. And then it comes up through there. You can see this one, the fire coming up through it. And you just use sticks. I mean, you can use pine cones. You can use little twigs and put them in there. It uses almost no fuel at all. And I mean, we would we would uh, heat up stove or uh, heat up a uh, soup in a just a regular pan with a lid on it. And I'd put fill up some chicken corn soup in there. Um, my grandfather taught me how to make that. and. Uh, and we put sort of a Lancaster County thing. Um, we put chicken corn soup in there or chili or something like that. And I mean, it was, I'd say maybe two or three minutes, it was boiling hot with that stove. I mean, they produce an incredible amount of heat. And you can run them, of course, just with the flame hitting underneath. Or there's a, this right here shows the, the lid that comes with it. And then this little handle here, you put that in to take the lid off so you can put more fuel down into it, more wood down into it. And um, it has a little pipe that comes off the back like that that you can see there so the smoke's not in your face or whatever else. It can go up and out. And uh, they work pretty good. They're not very expensive, and um, they can heat quite well. As you can see, this this guy right here, you know, doing that, cooking with it and things, which we we did that quite a few times. We cooked a lot of meals on our, on our dragon or hunter stove. Um, so that's another thing that you can do. Another option would be, um, the little Coleman gas grills like this. I actually have a vintage one. It was actually made in 1975, um, same year I was born. And, um, it, it can actually run off of gasoline, regular gasoline. So 
but I don't usually do that. I use like a Coleman, this stuff right here, the Coleman camp fuel is uh, what I would use on in my stove. And the one time I had it, uh, the first place my wife and I lived when we, after we got married, I had it out on the screen porch and I had all the window screens open. I thought I had enough ventilation, but what was happening is it was blowing the fumes of it into the living room. I got the cooking done for the meal that we made and I came in and I was in putting my books away in the living room, not really realizing there was a lot of fumes in that room. And I got carbon monoxide poisoning, which was not fun. Um, not fun at all. So those are different types of ways that you can cook um there so okay yes yeah, ice chest there so um that's pretty much it for cooking uh and the final thing the sixth biggest electric need would be communication um, be it a telephone um satellite internet type of a deal uh we our solution for that is we just have a place in town where we do that of course, most people would say, just get a cell phone. And that's true. You can have a cell phone. I'm not a big fan of cell phones, smartphones in particular. So I just, I stay away from that. And I say, if somebody wants to call me, it's the phone numbers here at the office. If I'm not here, leave something on the answering machine. And that's about it. I'm very old school along those lines. Um, when I go someplace, I don't want something tracking me. And so People can disagree with that. That's fine. Doesn't matter to me. Um, we, you say, what if you have a vehicle breakdown? That's the, the famous one. What if you have a vehicle breakdown? Well, what did people do in the past? People survived just fine. And uh, last year we did have a, I didn't do a vehicle breakdown. It's just, I locked my keys in the vehicle. I thought I pushed, I opened up the door to our Jeep and I thought I pushed the lock, you know, unlock on the door lock thing. And I thought I pushed unlock and so I took my keys and I threw them on the on the seat of the driver's seat and I shut the door and I went to get the back door open and I realized oh no I locked it and I thought oh no I just locked my keys in so my son and I we had to walk about five miles back to our property to get another set of keys to walk, to come back and we didn't walk back we drove a vehicle back but um uh, my wife and our dog had to stay at the vehicle because we had some stuff outside of the vehicle that we didn't put in yet. So we couldn't carry everything. We actually caught some fish. And so I, it was a bad situation, but we went, we went the whole way back. Nobody stopped to help us or anything else. So whatever, you know, I can understand why they wouldn't want to help me. I'm a little scary looking, I guess, but uh, my son, you know, he's seven year old boy walking along with his dad and nobody even said hey are you okay or whatever else whatever times are changing but uh we get by just fine without having a cell phone at our property and whatever else so um if you know if there was better some kind of i mean the satellite internet thing i've heard a lot of nightmare stories about that about how that they don't really work all that great and so we just never bothered with it but would that be um a possibility at some point in time i don't know maybe so but i think that covers everything um so if anybody has any questions go ahead write question and then your question there or did i miss anything i don't know if i missed anything in terms of different options for refrigeration lighting moving water heat cooking or communication telephone Montana, Montana people stopped to help. Yeah. My brother and his wife lived in Yak, Montana, up in the northwest corner. And um, he said he broke down the one time and and um, some guy pulled over. Hey, you know, let me help you out here and, and whatever. And, and he said, where you, where you live? My brother said, oh, I live in Yak. And the guy said, oh, I should probably get a gun first before I go there. <laughs> Back then it was a, kind of a little bit more wild, I guess. I don't know if it's any more civilized today but you know yeah i know you're right on that uh, john i know about that um definitely
question, what do you do with your trash? Um, they actually have a uh, like a dumpsters in the area and stuff. And you can take them to there and things. If it's a you know wood or cardboard or something like that or some kind of a thing like that, we'll burn it. Um, I was raised that way, burning trash. So, but you can you know there's dumps in the area and things that you can take it to. Question: Use RV fridge and biogas. EMP proof and biogas renewable. Yeah, I mean, there's different things like that. I just I have no experience in it, so I can't really say, oh yeah, that works good or whatever. I, you know, have not done that. Uh, question: What about a built-in fireplace with a chimney? Do those work as good as a wood stove, or is it different? Yeah, fireplaces are not really that great. They're more, I mean, there are ways that you can cook on them, but they were never really designed to heat homes. Um, per se, unless you're down south or something like in the Appalachian Mountains, people would heat their homes a little bit with that, but it's more about cooking indoors on an open fire that you can do about that, um, or that you can use like that. How about freeze dryer machines? I, I don't have any experience with that. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've seen stuff that's freeze dried, but I don't have any experience using anything like that. I would imagine it probably needs electricity. So, Brother Brian, I saw you had a thermal, thermal mass in your home a while back in a video. Do you still use it? No, we do not. Um, it was a rocket stove, a metal one, and it went into this thermal mass. And I actually put in our thermal mass, it was made out of wood. It was a wood frame. And then I put sand and gravel in it. And the rocket stove that we had it was it just doesn't heat all that well and we would get the thing going as hot as we could and it just would not heat up the thermal mass enough to really hold the heat in there and it was cold i mean it was maybe in the summertime i could have experimented a lot, little bit longer or, or in it when it wasn't real bad but it, we were freezing and it just okay you know enough of this so we got rid of that and put in um, a little camp stove a four dog stove brand and um, that they work really well. You know, we were actually warm then, and um, and then we looked for a, a vintage um, Fisher stove. So we have a Fisher stove in there now. Um, so I saw someone on YouTube use a gas heater with biogas, and it works. Also, the earth ship has natural heating during winter from thermal mass. Yeah, the earth ship thing, there's a, a Paul Wheaton, he gets into the thing of uh, the Wofati concept, which is a partly underground house and things. And There's a lot of really interesting research out there people are doing into ways to really save on heating costs and whatever else. And um, so, yeah. <clears throat> question what do you think about terracotta brick heaters compared to everything else uh, don't really have any experience with that I don't know so does anybody else have any other questions Okay, well then we'll close this one out, a little bit over an hour here, so um, tomorrow we will be talking about warm versus cold climate. Um, you know, there's a lot of different points to consider on that, you know, um, pros and cons of both uh, systems, so we will be talking about that tomorrow. Uh, Okay, a couple more questions came in here quick. I'll answer. Um, how much do those old wood stoves cost? Um, depending on the condition, you can find them, you know, you, you get the right situation. You can find them for $50 up to five or $600. Um, I've seen old wood stoves, old wood cook stoves, the really ornate, beautiful ones. They can go three or $4,000 for some of those things that are, that are really like an antique collectible beautiful one they can get really expensive um, so uh, 
but you know you go to a, a you get a really nice modern wood stove you're going to spend a couple thousand dollars anyhow so i'd rather have an old vintage one if you can find it um So, what about hay box? Don't know anything about that. How to get cheap firewood? Um, well, own your own property, and you can get pretty cheap firewood that way. You don't spend anything on it, but you can get off cuts from sawmills. That's a, a good way to do that. And finally, uh, you should encourage viewers to watch your wood video. If you haven't seen my video on the firewood scam thing, you can watch that. Um, so, oh, actually, okay. Good point. I didn't think about this one. The solar cooker thing, hay box cooker, uh, solar cooker. You can also do that as well. That's another thing we have, but we haven't had a chance to um, uh, use it very much yet. So that's another thing that you can use a little solar sun cooker, sun sun oven type of a thing too. So, but that's going to be it for this video. And uh, like I said, tomorrow we'll be talking about warm versus cold climate, some different things to consider there. Um, if you're thinking about going off grid eventually. So um, that will be it. Thank you, everybody out there, for your um, prayers and things and, and um, your support of the ministry. And we will see you tomorrow in the next video.